Faces here. Norwalk yeah. Community College, Latham Center, back in the back there. Yeah, Any familiar faces. Uh, just a little bit about me before we get started here. Uh, I actually work at Army Aviation Magazine. I do historical research for them up in Monroe, which is a periodical which is the flagship publication for the Army Aviation Association of America. That's a, a, a organization that caters to the aviation branch of the United States Army, somewhere along the lines like the United States Naval Institute, if someone is a member of that here, uh, so on and so forth. I also teach as an adjunct at Nall Community College, uh, the Extended Studies Program. I teach World War I, and I'm also teaching Iraq creation of colonialism in the spring. And I'm also, I also teach with the Lifetime Learners Institute at Nall Community College, and I do, I do about six courses for them, only two a semester, though. I do World War I, World War II, I do Vietnam, Iraq, and I'm also teaching the American Empire this spring. I'm going to be doing that this spring, and then I traipse about all over the state and I give talks on different mm -hmm. aspects of history, and uh, I've, pub I've written three books, USS Connecticut Constitution State Battleship, They'll have to follow you, The Triumph of the Great White Fleet, and On History, a Treatise, and I am almost at the end of another book, which is called Sky Soldiers, the Saga of Army Aviation, and that's only volume one. So I gotta do volume two yet. <laughs> what do you do in your spare time? Uh, sleep. <laughs> uh, you have an eight day. Beg your pardon? You have an eight day with the rest of the stuff. Boy, that'd be nice. 25 hours a day, eight days a week, that'd be nice, <laughs> anyway. Uh, World War I, uh, of the, uh, any course I teach, uh, to me, this one's the most important one. Uh, the, the, you know, World War I is the most important event in human history in the last 100 years. Uh, you live the way you do today because of this conflict, not World War II. World War II was a continuation of the first one. You wouldn't have had the second one, at least as it was, if it wasn't for the first one. Uh, Vietnam. How many here are Vietnam vets? Anybody here is a Vietnam vet? Okay, you were fighting. Still, you guys were fighting World War One. Uh, this is the product of World War One slash colonialism. We'll get into that next week with Versailles. Iraq. I mean, I had a kid who, as a Marine, put two combat tours in Iraq. I told him, I said, "You're still fighting World War One? Go back to the Sykes-Picot Agreement of 1916." He says, "Jesus." <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and then you look at Libya, Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan, Syria. Th they're all products of the First World War slash colonialism. The tragedy of the modern Balkans, the, the modern tragedy of the Balkans. This is World War I. And then go into Eastern and Central Europe with the shifting of populations and the redrawing of the borders. I'm sure someone's sitting here thinking, hmm, Ukraine comes to mind. Eh, hey, you'd be right. World War I, we can't seem to get away from this. The machine gun comes of age. 
submarine and torpedo, motorized transport, we're getting away from the horse and buggy to move men and troops and supplies, you know, we're moving, we're gravitating toward motorized transport, and that means what? Oil, right? Gasoline. Oil, War, World War I is being transformed by oil. Oil will dominate the second, and I'm going to get into that next week after we talk about Versailles. You know, huge changes are in the wind here, but the biggest change is that catastrophic, cataclysmic collapse of the 17th, 18th century dynasties. And if we want to get into how this happens, well, and the causes of the First World War, let's go back to 1789. What happens in 1789? Yeah, the French Revolution. You know, what was, what was the French Revolution and the American Revolution? They were, the, they, were, they were actions that saw the ideas of the age of enlightenment and reason put into action. You know, these ideas didn't originate with the French Revolution. They were unleashed in Europe by the French Revolution. The ideas of liberalism, democracy, republicanism, secularism, that's a big one, socialism, nationalism, parliamentarianism, where people can actually sit in assemblage and discuss the issues that, that, are, that are important to them, instead of having some faceless monarch who doesn't care about them in the first place handing down edicts from on high. Now, these are revolutionary changes here happening, and they're going to sweep across the breadth of the 19th century and undermine that monarchical system. And the fascinating aspect of this is, and I'll go into this last week with, well, last week with Iraq, is at the same time, these ideas are undermining the Ottoman Empire and the Caliphate, which is an empty political shell at this point anyway. It's fascinating to see at the same time the Caliphate is being undermined, what else is being undermined in Europe? You know, there were two, two actual blocks here that kept the people in line in Europe. Well, that's it. The regals and the church in Europe. The Catholic Church. You know, a part of the French Revolution was anti-clerical. If you go beyond the French Revolution, the Carbonari, that revolutionary organization in Italy, France, and Portugal, hated the Catholic Church hated the Catholic Church. During the French Revolutions, bishops not only lost their lives, they lost their territory too, and it was parceled out to the peasants. Emiliano Zapata is going to do that in Mexico. That's interesting. Remember Viva Zapata with uh, Marlon Brando? Yeah, yeah. These are revolutionary changes coming here. However, it does bring to light the military aspect here. We can't get away from this. Now, this is, this is you know, as, remember, what was it Patton once said? that nothing demands man's time, treasure, industry, and intelligence as war. Oh, well, that seems to be the case here. That seems to be the case here. Let's look at it this way. The Great French War. Has anyone heard of that term? Yeah, should be. The Great French War is what? Is not just the French Revolutionary War. That goes back, that starts in 1792, when the Austrians and the Dutch try to put down the French Revolution. You know, the monarchs didn't want these ideas I mentioned start spreading. They were going to kill this idea in the womb. That's what they were going to try to do. They're not going to do it, but they tried. But the Austrians and the Dutch, you know what's fascinating? The great French, or the French Revolutionary War is the first time in recorded history that people went up in a balloon to observe the opposing army. Oh my God. The Compagnie de Ristier, or Company of Aeronauts. And the Austrians and Dutch said the French are in league with the devil. <laughs> hmm. Look what we do today. The satellites and everything else. Wow. Yeah. But the Great French Wars from 1792 to 1802, followed by what? The Napoleonic Wars, 1803 to 1815. Now keep in mind, this is important because what you see come about well, as a result of this great French war, is something called levee en masse. Warfare is getting to the point here, ladies and gentlemen, that no longer can you rely on volunteers or professional soldiers. Why? The Industrial Revolution is beginning to snowball here. And you know what that means. More products, more production facilities, and what's technology doing? Doesn't it improve? It feeds on itself, right? 
Every generation, there's an improvement in technology. The military was no different here. So what's happening here? Weapons are being produced on a greater scale, and also these weapons are able to produce a greater harvest of humanity. That means we're killing each other at a higher rate. And what does that mean? Conscription, levee en masse. We need to conscript people, and we need to inscript entire economies. You know, the war starts off with these volunteers and professional soldiers, 1792. <laughs> but by 1793 or 1794, they need to conscript. Now, conscription's been around a while. It's been around a long time. But it's the, it's, it's the size of this conscription. France is going to be the first country in European history to have a million-man army. By the end of the Great French War, military historians estimate that the French had upwards of three and a half million served by the time this war was over with. Three and a half million. They also, they also estimate that by the time the Great French War is over, upwards of six and a half million Europeans will be dead in, in 23 and a half years. This is the beginning. Fast forward ahead to the First World War, where the Industrial Revolution has snowballed even more. <clears throat> In four years, eight and a half million soldiers will be dead and six and a half million civilians. So we go from the Great French War, six and a half million dead in 23 and a half years, to World War I where we have 15 million dead in four years, and then we go to the big one, what we call World War II, where in six years, six and a half years, upwards of 55 million dead. See what happens here? Huh. You know what? 30 million of those dead were on the Russian front in 47 months. That war, that's the greatest land war in history between Hitler and Stalin. And Adolf and Uncle Joe. So it was a 30 million dead in 47 months. This is total war. You are seeing this now. There's that term total war. But the fact of the matter is here, what happens in the Great French War is significant you see the disappearance of things like the Holy Roman Empire. December 2nd, 1805, Napoleon defeats at the Battle of Austerlitz. He defeats the Austrians and the Russians. Some military historians again say this was his set piece battle. That's not the important aspect, or that's important militarily. The important aspect here is what happens three weeks later, the Treaty of Pressburg. The Holy Roman Empire, which had existed for centuries, if you want to go back as far as Charlemagne, that's 800 AD, and we're in 1805. December 26, 185. Guess what? The Holy Roman Empire is wiped off the map. And what happens? The Confederation of the Rhine. Napoleon puts together 16 German states as a buffer to who? Tsarist Russia. Again, fast forward over 100 years. And what's going to happen at Versailles? You know, Georges Clemenceau is going to want a what? A resurrected Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, so on and so forth, as a bulwark to who? Bolshevik Russia. Has much changed here? No. No. History repeats itself. But we see here with this, Napoleon tightening his grip on Europe. And these ideas unleashed by the French Revolution still do not die. For instance, he, he closes the, the Catholic Church ghettos for Jews. They're going to come back when he's gone. Go back to Cum Nimis Absurdum, Pope Paul IV. That was July 14, 1555, when the Catholic Church enacted these ghettos for Jews. They served as a model for the Nazis. He stops this. This is at the same time you begin to see here, now that he's organized the Confederation of the Rhine, this budding German nationalism. Gee, people speak roughly the same language. The Rhine and the Danube, the river traffic, unites these 16, these 16 city-states or, or provinces. Same thing's happening in Italy. Italians now are going to begin to feel like Italians. The little Risorgimento, the organization of in Italy, that's going to come later on down the road. However, keep in mind one thing. Two things are going to kill Napoleon. And I'm sure some of you people know what that was. He invades Russia in 1812. Of course, unlike Hitler, he's going to take Moscow. He just can't hold it. Although Napoleon writes after his downfall, one of the things that killed him 
was the five-year guerrilla campaign against the Spanish on the Iberian Peninsula. That helped to kill him because it took up many resources and men that he had to devote to that, to that campaign. Yeah, he defeated the Spanish army, but he couldn't keep the people down. Of course, one of the long-range effects of that is since he occupied Spain, what do you think happened to Spain's empire over here in the New World? Yeah, they lost it. You know, and when the treasure galleons stopped running, you know there was that gravy train of gold and silver coming out of Central and South America to fill the Spanish treasury. What do you think happened to the Spanish monarchs after that gravy train stopped? And then you have this up and down trend through Spanish history all through the 19th century until what? The Spanish Civil War, and then Franco comes along a fascist. That's the tragic aspect of Spanish history. But the fact of the matter is, Napoleon's going to be out by 1815. And then you have the Congress of Vienna. Now, the monarchs, you know, you're, you're, going, to, you're going to see this new balance of power come up in Europe. The idea here is they want, they want these ideas. They want, they want to kill these ideas. So what happens here? The Congress of Vienna, Russia, Prussia, the Habsburgs, Austria. France is eventually going to be readmitted when a Bourbon is put back on the throne. You remember, you know, Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI got haircuts during the French Revolution. They're gone. But the Bourbons are going to be readmitted. Why? Those other monarchs want a monarch on the French throne. Keeps everything in the family, so to speak. Keep in mind, this is going to be like a mafia setup. They're going to, they're going to divide up Europe for their, for their own agenda. Tsarist Russia, the Austrians. And the Prussians will keep an eye on Eastern and Central Europe, and the Austrians are going to filter into Northern Italy. France, when they're readmitted here, will keep an eye on Western Europe. Britain? Britain emerges you know, as a superpower here. Of course, their trump card is what? The Royal Navy. The Royal Navy. You know, Britain's agenda always was to make sure that not one power held primacy on the continent. What did they do in the Great French War? They went to war, they joined the other European powers to put the French back in line. What are they going to do in the First World War? They're going to join France and other countries to put the Germans in line. That, seems to, that seemed to be, for centuries, the British role in Europe. You know, the British were the, the, British were the class colonial power. And one of the reasons they were, they know how to read a map, for one thing. <laughs> And I'll get into that with the Iraq, with the Iraq uh, talk. That's a fascinating talk, how the British Empire moved into the Middle East. But at this point, you see the demise of Napoleon and now a new balance of power. Now, one of the fascinating aspects of this is what happens over here. I mentioned the decline of the New World Empire, the Spanish, and the French, too. However, Congress of Verona, 1822 you begin to see these monarchs want to admit Spain back into the fold. How do they do that? Need an empire, don't they? They need an empire. They need to get that gold and silver. They need those riches out of the New World. Congress of Verona, they're going to put together an army, mainly French, to get those colonies back for the Spanish Empire, or this, what they want is the Spanish Empire. Because the only, the, only, the only colonies they have over here really are what? Cuba and Puerto Rico, and they're going to lose those in the 1898 war with us. However, the important fact here is what comes out after that, after 1822, what comes out in 1823? The Monroe Doctrine, remember that one? What was Monroe saying? He was telling the Europeans, stay the heck out. We don't need you colonizing these new republics. That's basically the message here. That's basically the message. Guess who supports the Monroe Doctrine? The British. The Brits. Why? They don't want to come back here and, and fight a resurrected French or Spanish empire. Why? They're moving into the Middle East, which they begin to do in 1763. And I'll go into the details of that two weeks from now. But the fact of the matter is, I remember the, my one British admiral once said, Americans don't realize it. He was talking about this during the, God bless you, during the Napoleonic Wars. For the United States, the Alps for them is the Royal Navy. Because if Britain falls, this is that, you know, remember we, the Louisiana Purchase, we, got, we bought that territory from Napoleon, right? From the French? Right. That doesn't mean you wouldn't want to come back and take it. 
He needed that money to fight his war. That's why he sold it for $15 million. Needed that money to fight his war in Europe. That doesn't mean he wouldn't be coming back here, but the Royal Navy prevents that. Tragedy, we went to war with the British in 1812, but that's neither here nor there. But you see at this point these burgeoning movements popping up. I mentioned them before, the Carbonari. Ardent nationalist. You are seeing nationalism spread across the continent like a plague. Italians, French. You know, they, many French didn't like the monarchs anymore, the regals anymore. There is a Bourbon back on the throne. They're going to last until 1830, until Charles X has given the old heave ho. But the fact of the matter is, you are seeing, like in Italy, the Carbonari, 1820, a revolution. The Austrians helped to put it down. It's too early to unite the country. It's too early. About 40 years too early. But you know how it goes. The pressure builds up. You know, the monarchs looked weak in the French Revolution. People are getting some guts here. They're organizing. They're organizing. Now, another important aspect of this was, was called the Holy Alliance, which was Russia, <coughs> Prussia, and Austria. Kind of a subgrouping, as opposed to the major grouping of monarchs in Europe. Their, their shtick was to take care of Eastern and Central Europe. However, the Congress of Trapau, they agree to keep these areas in line. However, in the two Sicilies, this is interesting, there was an uprising, almost 1820. The thing that scares the monarchs is it's not just the people. Elements of the army join the people. <laughs> Can't have that. The Austrians went in there and, and ruthlessly put this down ruthlessly put this down. 1830, I mentioned. There's an uprising in France. Finally, the Bourbons are out. Charles X is the last, is the last absolute monarch in France. Philippe, Louis Philippe of the House of Orléans takes over a constitutional monarchy in France. You see what's happened here? Some of the promises now of the French Revolution are now, be, are now coming to fruition here. Liberté, fraternité, égalité, so on and so forth. Many years after, but now you're seeing, you are now beginning to see the forest through the trees. You're now beginning to see the forest through the trees. These ideas are, as I mentioned, are spreading. 1848, the springtime of nations. Mass upheaval, not only in France, in Germany, Holland, Belgium so on and so forth. Of course, 1839, Belgium was parceled off from the Kingdom of Netherlands, and the, Brit and the British and the Prussians signed an agreement to, to, verify, to verify Belgian neutrality. And, that's, and I'm going to get into that next week a little bit. On how, no, tonight, actually, to the end, of how that helped to tip, that was the tipping point for the British to get into the First World War. I'll get into that at the end. So you're beginning to see these, 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 these realms break up here. It's what you're seeing. Of course, part of the reason you had the springtime of nations is as capitalism is gaining strength and this industrial revolution is spreading, what's happening to some of these people from the farm? Are they gravitating to the city to find work in the factories? And what happens to them there? 10, 12, 15 hours a day, five, six days a week. And what happens in some of the cities? The inevitable slum. And who else comes along as a beacon for people who are stuck in the slums? Marx, the Communist Manifesto, him and Frederick Engels. Yeah, yeah, interesting, fascinating. Of course, part of this, too, were, were famines. Ireland, didn't many of the Irish come over here? There was famine in Germany, there was some famine in France. Yeah, that was going on in Europe. Help, you know, empty bellies breeds discontent. I mentioned that in my Iraq class. Uh, do you, do you, yeah, it does. Empty bellies breeds discontent. Mm -hmm. Happens time after time after time here. Look at Russia, the Bolsheviks. You know, Lenin promised the peasant the land. And some of them were starving. Ah, yeah, okay. Goodbye, Tsar. Hello, Lenin. Of course, Joe Stalin's going to change things, but you, know, you go into 1918, 1919, and that's what you see. It's not much different than what happened at the French Revolution. However, as we go along here by the 1850s, 1860, 
the Il Risorgimento, the unification of Italy, is coming, as is the unification of Germany. And who's instrumental in that? Otto von Bismarck, the Iron Chancellor. Now, Bismarck's fascinating here. Otto von Bismarck was fascinating. Now, he was also for some social programs for the people. Now, don't think Otto von Bismarck was the social emancipator. No, he wasn't. He knew that to build, to build a strong, industrialized Germany, you better cut the people in. You better, you, better give them, you better throw them some bones here, or else we're going no place. That was the general idea. However, at the same time as he's generating power here, you had the Crimean War. Now, the Crimean War is interesting. You are beginning to see Tsarist Russia trying now to encroach in the Balkans. And what's Bismarck going to say later on? It's going to be some damn thing in the Balkans that's going to start a general war. <coughs> well, you see this, actually, the semblance of this with the Crimean War, 1854-56. You know, 500,000 men died in that war in 33 months. 300,000 uh, sickness and disease and so on and so forth. The fascinating aspect is, the long-range aspects of this is, you know, the seeds for this are sown in 1774 with a treaty known as Kutchuk Kanyarja. I don't expect you to remember that name, but the basic idea is Tsarist Russia forced the Ottomans to have the Eastern Orthodox Church, <coughs> Christian Church, oversee Christian interests in the Holy Land. You think the Vatican liked that? No. 1853, Napoleon III is trying to resurrect France as a power of importance, just like Napoleon I was doing. What happened? They arm twist the Ottomans to make sure that the Catholic Church oversees the interests in the Holy Land. Well, what, how are the Russians viewing this? That they're being eased out of the Middle East. You know, religion's being used here as, as, as a political bludgeon. That's what it's being used for here. So the Russians take two provinces from the, from the Ottomans in Romania, and the Crimean War starts. Now it's interesting. Britain and France, two Christian countries, join the Turks, they're Muslims, right, to fight another Christian country. Now this is, that, this is fascinating. You have France is what, Catholic? Joining a country that's Protestant, basically Protestant, the British, to fight a country that's Eastern Orthodox and joining the Muslims to do so. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the British and the French invade the Crimea, 1854, 1856. You know, the same war that Nigel Bruce and Errol Flynn charged up the Balaclava Heights, charge of the Light Brigade. This is the war. The Russians are going to pull out of those two provinces they took in Romania, but of course, Romania is going to be free in another 20 years anyway. But the fact of the matter is, what does this war do? Well, remember what I said before about the Holy Alliance? Russia, Prussia, and Austria? Austria never went to Russia's aid in this war. That could have been the start of the Great War in 1854, if they had done so. That could have been the start of the Great War. It doesn't happen here. Austria doesn't take part. Of course, keep in mind, what are the Austrians religiously? Catholic, for the most part? Yeah. Russians are what? Eastern Orthodox, right? OK, then now we're back to this Sunni Shia difference you have with among the Muslims. The Prussians, they don't get involved. So what happens to the Holy Alliance? Falls apart. Yet Bismarck understands this later on down the road. Interesting what happens here. You have the formation of Italy, right? Eight in the 1860s, you know, Count de Cavour and Garibaldi, so on and so forth. They get almost everything except Rome and Venezia. Romantic Venezia. Yeah. However, what happens in 1862? You begin to see Germany, uh, you know, the Kingdom of Denmark, goes to absorb Schleswig-Holstein in northern Germany. And the, the, Germans, uh, the Prussians say, oh, no, 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 I have to stay with the German states. So what does Bismarck do? Bismarck, interesting, Bismarck gets the Austrians on his side and defeats the Danes. Schleswig-Holstein stays with the German states. And then in 1866, 
he goes to war with the Austrians so the Prussians can take control of the German states. Now, what does Bismarck do? He asks the Italians for help. And you're laughing. Yeah, you, can, you can see where this trend is coming? Yeah. He asked the Italians for help. Why? Bismarck always said Germany, if it goes to war, should never take on coalitions. And if she's going to go to war, should always get help. That's a message the Kaiser and Hitler seem to miss. But what happens here? The Italians join them. Why? Because, because Bismarck promised them, look, if you help me, I'll make sure you get Venezia. What a deal. Sure enough, eight weeks, they beat the Austrians. And he keeps his word. Venezia becomes part of Italy. No longer an Austrian sat trap anymore. Now it goes to Italy. And then they're eventually going to get Rome, and the whole thing is complete. Bismarck kept his word. There's one side note here. After that 1866 war with the Austrians and the German states are, for all intents and purposes, now united, uh, there was an aspect of there was a there was a there was a uh, the threat of a war between Britain uh, between France and the United States in 1865. If you recall, remember Maximilian, Mexico. Yeah, the French were trying to resurrect an empire here. Remember Don Benito Juarez got ousted. And Maximilian, who was an Austrian lackey anyway, Habsburg lackey, who Napoleon III put on the throne there, bolstered by the French army, is that, does that run counter to the Monroe Doctrine? Yeah, it sure does. 1858, 1859, 1860. But what happens after 1860? The American Civil War? Is there much Abraham Lincoln can do about his French problem in Mexico? No, there isn't. No, there isn't. You know, he got chided for that and criticized for that in some, by some quarters. Well, what's he going to need to do? The Union Army's not ready. And on top of that, beginning 1861, he's got to build this Union Army to take on who? The Confederacy. What's more important, the Confederacy at this point or the French? The Confederacy. However, interesting thing here. By 1860, April 1865, of course, this is after uh, the, uh, Lincoln's assassinated. After April, uh, April 1865, Andrew Johnson's president. He sends 50,000 Union troops, battle-hardened Union troops, led by Phil Sheridan, down to the Texas border. There's a chance here that America and France could go to war. Doesn't happen. Why? Because the Prussians beat the Austrians and unite Germany. Napoleon III is not stupid. He takes a look at a map. I need those men from Mexico and bring them home. Well, without the French army, what do you think happens to Maximilian? He's off the throne. He's not only off the throne, he buys the farm. <laughs> Benito Juarez is going to get rid of him. <clears throat> We're done. And then Mexican history proceeds on as it does. But yeah, there was a chance that France and the United States could have gone to war here. That would have been interesting. Interesting war, a battle-hardened Union army. Do you know the Union Army is interesting? You know, America, all through the 19th century, never liked a large regular army. Do you know Congress, and generations of congressmen always thought that that was a danger to the Grand Republic, which is why we had our militia system. Fascinating aspect here. The day the, uh, the Confederacy surrendered, the Union Army was 2,213,000 men. Wow. And then guess what happened two years later? It's down to 57,000 men. By 1876, the year Custer met his demise, it was down to 26,000 and change. Congress emasculated the United States Army. Still in that colonial mindset. Large army, threat to the Grand Republic. However, Germany is interesting here. Bismarck, Otto von Bismarck. You know, Bismarck learns the lesson from the, from the Crimean War. You know. And he sees what's going on here. The Ottoman Empire is weakening. It's accelerating here. Why? The British are insinuating themselves in the Middle East. The French are insinuating themselves in the Middle East. The Russians are trying to get there. And I'm sure now you're thinking, well, gee whiz, Vladimir Putin, doesn't the Russian Navy have a base in Syria right now? Yeah, they sure do. <laughs> they sure do, which is something the British never wanted the Russians to have. 
This is called the great game, if you remember that term. But the fact of the matter is, Bismarck takes a look at a map. He resists a lot of pressure from people in Germany, even the, fam even, even, even the, uh, even, even the, the, the Kaiser's family. You know, there are people in Germany who wanted them to get into the colonial game, and Bismarck says no. Germany's future is not in Africa, Asia, wherever. Germany's future is in Europe. You know, he was asked, he was actually pressured one time, and he took a map out. Talking to uh, members of the royal family and a couple of military advisors, he takes a map out of Europe. He points to Germany, points to Tsarist Russia, and points to France and says, this is my map of Africa. <laughs> Point well made. He knew that Germany's future is as an industrial power. And he said, one thing else you don't do, besides not going after colonies, we do not build an ocean-going navy. Why? That will antagonize the British. Why do we want to do that for? Why do we want to do that for? Now, after they defeat the French in the 1870-71 war, where they proclaim the German Empire, Bismarck fashions a new balance of power. You know, gone is that Congress of Vienna, where the monarchs fashioned the ba balance of power. There's a new balance of power here. Keep in mind, in 1815, that balance of power that was fashioned by the monarchs did not include in Italy or Germany. They didn't exist. Now, the Congress of Vienna, it's obsolete. You need a new balance of power, and Bismarck is going to fashion it. He's going to fashion it. Now, he learns, he learns from the Crimean War that you better, have, you better keep Russia benign and a French. He did not want the French involved in European politics. Why? Again, he takes a look at a map. You know, geography, that thing we don't teach our young anymore. He takes a look at a map, and he sees Germany. It's in between what? France and Russia, right? Yeah. So what do we do here? He made the Three Emperors League, a treaty between Tsarist Russia, the Habsburgs in Austria, and Germany. He ties Russia and Austria to Germany. So France cannot make an alliance with Germany. France is now out in the cold. Bismarck's idea is the French want to go after Vietnam in the Southeast Asia, let them. If they want to go to Africa, let them. They're not involved in European politics. He's actually getting what he wants. He's restructuring the balance of power in Europe his way, with Germany the central point. Isn't Germany the center of yes. Europe now because of its industrial power? Yeah. And you know what else Bismarck said? Make a good treaty with Russia if you want peace in Europe. Makes you wonder what these beltway blowhards are thinking you know, <laughs> with Putin over here. It's amazing. You don't think Merkel understands this? Yes, she does, because what did she do not long ago? She said, we are not going to give weapons to the Ukrainians. She threw, the, she threw that back at us. So what are we going to do? You know, she's not stupid here. She's not stupid. Interesting how things don't change from that much from the 19th century to the 21st. Wow. You know, it's the same old story. The cast of characters changes, but the basic script of this play is the same. How many times can you redo, you know, My Fair Lady here? <laughs> which is basically what's going on here. Which is basically what's going on. So Bismarck now is fashioning Germany as the central power in Europe, in European affairs. And again, he's doing this because he understands that as the Ottomans recede in the Balkan Peninsula, the Austrians and the Russians are going to start vying for influence here. Why? Well, who are a lot of the people in the Balkans? Are they Slavs? What are the Russians? Slavs. You're beginning to get this idea in Europe, this virulent <coughs> nationalism that's beginning to spread here. If you remember that term, the pan-Slav flood that the Germans don't like? Yeah. You're beginning to see works come out, literary works come out, where you know, the, the Germans are looking upon Slavs as what? Remember the term Untermensch? Untermensch. Subhuman, right? OK. Well, we don't want a Europe polluted by, this is before the Jews. We don't want Europe polluted by, the, by Slavs. You know, we're above that. 
It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Do you know in Ukraine right now, in the, especially the western end of Ukraine, where the virulent nationalism really is in Ukraine, do you know you're seeing graffiti on buildings, bridge abutments, and walls, spray painted, drawn, whatever? Ukrainians will not be ruled by Russians, Poles, or Jews. This smacks of the 1920s. Yeah, you're seeing that now. You're seeing that now. What's the difference between what's the difference between now and what I'm talking about? You think there's a difference? I don't think so. Again, cast of characters has changed a bit. Basic script is the same. But this is what Bismarck's trying to do. The Three Emperors League, the Reinsurance Treaty. Let's keep Russia and Austria tied to us. By doing that, we keep the French ostracized and we keep the appetites of the, of the Austrians and the Russians capped so they don't go to war over the spoils of the Balkans. Of course, that's going to happen in the 1877-1878 Russo-Turkish War. The Ottomans are becoming that weak where the Russians go to war with them. And they win quite well. Bulgaria becomes a principality, which satisfies the Russians because the Bulgarians are what? They're Slavs. Romania, Serbia, Montenegro are now independent, not only, not, you know, not only in name, but in reality. Bosnia and Herzegovina, autonomous. However, however, Bismarck steps in. He understands, again, the balance of power. He's willing to, so you know, the, the, you know, the British are concerned here. If the Ottomans actually collapse in the Balkans, the Russians can have access to that warm weather access to the Mediterranean. So Bismarck steps in. <coughs> Congress, of, Congress of, uh, of Berlin. Treaty of Berlin. Bulgaria can remain a principality. Romania can be virtually free. However, however Mold, uh, Moldavia will go to the Russians. Serbia. Is, is, is independent. However, Bosnia and Herzegovina will be administered by the Austrians. Administered by the Austrians. And I'm going to get into a few minutes why that became important. Macedonia will stay with the Ottomans. So they'll still have that foothold in Europe, so to speak, but that blocks the Russians from getting that warm weather access. So what did he do? What did Bismarck do here? He gave everybody a piece of the action and put British fears to rest. Peace in Europe? Yes. And who did it? Bismarck. There are some historians that say once the pilot was gone, the whole thing fell apart. That's going to happen in 1890. Of course, a quick reference to the Berlin, uh, the Berlin Congress in 1885 where they all sat down, these European powers sat down, to talk about Africa. You know, the, the, the race for African colonies was beginning to heat up here. So what did they do? They all sat down and said, okay, you can have this, you can have this, you can have this. African people didn't have any say in that, but all their territories were all carved up by the Europeans. Keep in mind, up to that point, 70% of Africa was virtually free, if you want to call it that. Not after 1885. So they prevented a, they prevented a general war. America sent representatives to that Congress. You know, we didn't get anything out of them, but observer status only, really. And Africa ceased to exist, and it's you know, as a free as a free entity, all in sway to the colonial powers. 1890, what happens? Bismarck's gone. Kaiser Wilhelm II. You know who his grandmother was? Queen Victoria, right? Uh, you know, the, the, the Wilhelm II was was cousin to Tsar Nicholas II of the Romanovs of Russia, who in turn was related to the, the King of England. And it's a mafia set up. <laughs> and, they were, they, and, they, and they're dividing up Europe, you know, and they're deciding the fate of millions by playing Monopoly with real buildings. <coughs> That's what they're doing. That's exactly what they're doing. However, with Bismarck gone, you know, the Kaiser gets rid of him. What do you think happens here? He doesn't redo the Reinsurance Treaty. He doesn't redo the Free Emperor's League. And after 20 years out in the cold, who comes back into European politics? 
France. And in 1894, France and Russia sign an accord. Now Germany is stuck in the middle. This is the beginning of what you see here of these alliances that are going to come by the 1914. The picture has changed here. Russia is virtually free to do what it wants because now it's not tied to the Germans anymore. What did Bismarck say? What did I say he said? Make a good treaty with Russia and you keep peace in Europe? Hmm. Yeah, interesting. Interesting. And the Kaiser does else. What else does he do? 1898, the Flotten Gazettes, or naval law. We are now going to build a large navy. And what do you think happens in England? The radar goes up. Von Tirpitz, the admiral, they're going to build an ocean-going navy. The Germans do build, build good ships. You've got to give them that. They didn't build enough of them, but they built great ships for the time. And that's going to be a problem. You know, the Kaiser wants to get in. You know, the Kaiser is jealous of his cousin in England. You know, the, the English monarch is not an absolute. He's a constitutional monarchy, yet he enjoys the world's largest navy, has the world's largest empire, goes boating every other day. <laughs> Wilhelm II is an absolute doesn't have any of this. You know, during the Spanish-American War of 1898, when we, got the, when we got Puerto Rico, we joined that club of imperialist powers. That's exactly what we did. Uh, we got Puerto Rico. Cuba became a free nation. We also grabbed the Philippines and, and Guam and the Marianas. You know, after Dewey took Manila Bay, you know who showed up? The Germans. Otto von Dietrichs with a five or six ship German task force. You know, the Germans wanted the Philippines, you know. And Dewey told them, well, look, you either leave the way it came in or shoot it out. Actually, the Japanese and the British would rather us take the Philippines than the Germans. The, British, the Japanese did not want the Germans taking the Philippines. It's not what they wanted. Better us than the Germans. Interesting. But anyway, the Kaiser's going to build a large navy, trying to take his place on the world scene. And as the 19, 1899 blends into the 20th century, 1900, 1901, you begin to see the 1914 alliances beginning to take shape. Austria-Hungary is allied to the Germans. Italy is allied with the Germans, although not for long, but she's allied with the Germans. In 1904, what happens? The British and the French sign an accord. It's not actually a military alliance. They agree to pool their resources in the face of rising German power. Why? Because Britain is beginning to see in Germany what she saw with Napoleonic France. We need to rein in burgeoning German power. Of course, the British are looking at it, too, from a naval perspective. And in 1904, the British and the French sign an accord. But that doesn't mean the British and the Russians are together because France and Russia is. That's yet to come. Keep in mind, at this point, the British do not see the French as much of a threat anymore because of their united interest against Germany. The, Ru the British do not want to see the Russians getting in the Middle East. They are afraid, the crown jewel of their empire, that the, British, that the Russians are going to get into the Asia and get into the Middle East. You know in the 1904-1905 Russo-Japanese War, remember that one? You know the British signed an alliance with the Japanese in 1902? Out of fear, or concern, let's put it that way, out of concern of burgeoning Russian naval power in the Pacific. And, you know, colonial India was the, was the crown jewel of the British Empire. So they signed an alliance with the Japanese. You know what that alliance read in 1902? Because the Japanese were building up the Imperial Navy. That alliance read that if either party was attacked by the Russians, as long as the Russians had help, keep in mind this is 1902, not 1904. But if Russia, if Russia attacked either of these parties and Russia had help, the other signatory would jump in. The country in question here was France, because in 1894, the French and the Russians signed an alliance. So 
That was a concern for the British. Why? Because the British had colonies in the Pacific, right? Yeah, they sure did. Well, we know from the 1945 Russo-Japanese War, what happens? The Japanese Imperial Navy destroys Russian naval power. So the concern about Russia is kind of going to the back burner. However, keep in mind, the British in 1905 are still concerned about rising German naval power. So they redo that alliance with the Japanese. And that alliance reads that if either party is attacked, the other will jump in. You know, no more if the, if, the offending, if the offending power that's attacking one of the other signatories has help. No, 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 no. If either Britain or Japan are attacked by an outside power, the other jumps in. Now, why did the British do this? Simple. They're concerned about rising German power. And despite the fact the Royal Navy is the world's largest naval force, they are pulling ships out of the Pacific and sending them to the North Sea. Scapa Flow and Rosa to block the North Sea, to block the Germans from getting out. That's what they're doing. And by signing that accord with the French in 1904, they begin to pull some ships out of the Mediterranean, send them home. Now the idea here, now this is interesting how, how the British actually fashion this. The British are not only concerned about the Germans, they're concerned about the Japanese. So if they have an alliance with the Japanese, the idea here is to rein in Japanese ambitions. <coughs> And also, perhaps maybe even use the Imperial Navy to help keep their colonies too. You know, the British, or, you know, so the British don't lose their colonies. We'll use the we'll use the Imperial Navy to do that work. Two countries do not like this arrangement: New Zealand and Australia. And you know, they are they are very they're very they're very uh, unhinged about Japanese expansion. Keep in mind, it's important to understand. That, you know, this is the golden age of, the, of, the, of in colonialism here. And most of the colonial powers were what? Christian European? Who are the Japanese? Orientals? You know. Yellow skin and slanted eyes? They don't look like Europeans. Hmm. Is the world beginning to change here? Yeah, you've heard this, you've heard, you've seen this repeatedly today. Power is eventually shifting east. <coughs> Is this the beginnings of this? You know, historical changes do not happen like this. They take place over years, decades, centuries. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Yes, it is interesting. It's fascinating. That said, New Zealand and Australia do not like the idea of rising Japanese power. If the British are pulling out, and keep in mind, the Australians and New Zealanders do not have the shipbuilding capacity to replace what the British are pulling out. <clears throat> and I know, because I wrote my book on this, on the Great White Fleet. When the announcement for the Great White Fleet came out, New Zealand and Australia, right away to Washington. You're free to visit. 16 battleships sailing around the world. We are now getting into this too. The great Navy race, the great battleship race, the world's first modern strategic arms race. That's what the battleship race was. Yes, we're going we're to accept those invitations. And it's because of the great white fleet visits to New Zealand and Australia, August, July, August of 1908, that we enjoy the relationships that we do with these two countries. These two countries were very, very important to us strategically in two world wars, especially the second. Talk to guys who were on New Zealand and Australia, you know, in between fighting in the Solomons and New Guinea. Okay. <coughs> Interesting. Now we are becoming that a power in the Pacific, and the sides are being chosen up. As the, jet, as the British recede, it's like anything else. Whenever there's a void, another power fills that void. What's happening here is the British pull out, two powers are filling the void in the world's largest ocean the United States and the Japanese. Set the seeds for December 7, 1941. You know it. You know it. Meanwhile, back to Europe. Italy. <clears throat> Italy is looking to get into the colonial game. Now, this is kind of funny in a way. You know, the, the French are in Morocco. You know, the Italians are interested. They're, they're, act they're, actually, the fun, they're actually the fun people of this group. <laughs> I remember my father, a World War, my father's gone now. He was a World War II Navy vet. And I remember my father was saying, he says, he says, I don't know why the hell these Germans didn't figure this out. Every time they go to war, the Italians know when to bolt for that door. <laughs> the Italians were looking to have an empire in Africa, too. 
And it's interesting, the Triple Alliance, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy, right? Okay. They're talking to the French about taking Tripolitania. France isn't part of the Triple Alliance. You know, the virulent nationalism that's going on here is amazing. It really is. Everybody is for themselves. You know this thing about being allies? Now, what are allies? Allies aren't friends. Allies are somebody or other nation you have something in common with. Look at the Grand Alliance, the United States, Britain, and, and the Soviet Union, right? Why, did that, why, was that, why was that put together? Hitler? What happened when Hitler was dead? What happened to the Grand Alliance? <laughs> Fell apart. Didn't exist. Fell apart. And hence the Cold War. But however, go back, go back to the uh, area, area we're talking about, early 20th century here. The Italians were looking to get into Tripolitania, one of the three provinces of what we call Libya. There's nothing in Tripolitania. The French didn't want it. The British weren't going to strike out from Egypt together. But no, the Italians got to get in Africa. We got to be part of this. We got to be part of this great race for, for colonies. And they actually tell the French, you know, hey, you know something? We won't say much about you people in Morocco if you don't say much about us in Tripolitania. Well, the French go, yeah, okay, do what you want. Knock yourself out. <laughs> the Russians, the same thing. They tell the Russians. This goes into 1911. This is interesting. Tell the Russians, hey, you know something? We won't say anything. You know, we won't complain if you're looking to get into the, you know, the, the Sea of Mamar, the Dardanelles, to get that warm weather access to the Mediterranean, as long as you don't say anything about us getting into the, into the into Libya. Yeah, go ahead, knock yourself out. So they're only helping. They're only helping the Russians with the Turks, because the Turks are growing weaker. So sure enough, September 1911, the Italo-Turkish War over Tripolitania. You know, this is the first war in history where aircraft bomb people? November 1st, 1911, an Italian pilot named uh, Giulio Gavati, little Italian lieutenant, in a Taub monoplane, which in, a, which in essence was a combustible kite. <laughs> Your family sedan goes faster than this plane. <laughs> this guy has a leather pouch in his lap. Four hand grenades weigh four and a half pounds a piece made by the Sapelli Grenade Company. 18 pound bomb load. He flies over two Turkish held oases at Tagush and Anzar, I think they are. Makes two passes over each area. And as he's making a pass, he pulls the pin out of a grenade and throws it out of a cockpit. You know, this is an open cockpit type plane, you know. The Turks are scattering in terror. No, they didn't been bombed before. They don't know what this is like. Sounds like the Austrians and Dutch, they're in, league, they're in league with the devil. I always found, you know, working in Army Aviation Magazine, and I've said this up there, I said, I always found this progression fascinating. Oh, what do you mean? Again, going back to man's penchant to improve technology. November 1, 1911, you got a little Italian lieutenant in a Taub monoplane, a combustible kite, throwing hand grenades out of the cockpit, bomb load of 18 pounds. 18 pounds, not 180 pounds, 18 pounds. And yet, 34 years later, Colonel Paul Tibbetts, with 11 other guys in a B-29 Super Fortress, is going to drop one bomb on Hiroshima with the equivalent of 20,000 tons of TNT, and this is 34 years. You understand that technological progression here? <laughs> wow! And that B-29 has a pressurized interior. Gavati's in a plane with an open cockpit. Amazing, absolutely fascinating. Going back to the Italians again, actually going to the Austro-Hungarians, 1909. I mentioned earlier, post-Russo-Turkish War, Bismarck set it up so that the Austrians would administer Bosnia and Herzegovina. Serbs want that. Why? Those are, those are Slavs there, correct? Austrians aren't Slavs, they're Germanics. Well, guess what? The, the Austrians are going to tell the Russians, we don't want to administer it anymore. We want to <coughs> absorb it into the Austro-Hungarian Empire. However, and the Russians fall for this again, we really won't stop you from trying to grab the Sea of Mamar or the Dardanelles to get that warm weather access. Well, you know, the Russians are going to weigh this up and say, OK, they think this is, this is like October of 19, 1909. September 1909, they think this is something the Austrians are going to do months, even a year down the road. 
Guess what? The following month, the Austrians, without telling the Russians, absorbed these two areas. St. Petersburg is incensed. Serbia is incensed. Serbia is ready to go to war against Austria. It's not going to happen in 1909, fans. It's not going to happen. Why? Because the Russians are still digging out from that defeat of the 1945 Russo-Japanese War. So Russian backing for the Serbs winds up being a goose egg. However, who backs the Austrians? The Germans. And that's real. That's real. You know who's going to learn from this incident? Stalin. Joseph Stalin will. Why? Because in 1914, when the First World War starts, Russia still isn't ready. Yet, after the Archduke Franz Ferdinand is assassinated and the Austrians are bullying the Serbs, honor dictates that Russia will have to honor their agreement with the Serbs and as the big brother of Slavs everywhere, they're going to have to honor their, they're going to have to honor their pledge to, to help the Serbs. Well, this is 1914, not 1909, but either way it makes no difference because Russia of all the major powers was the least industrialized, the least organized power in Europe. The Russian soldier is probably the least educated of any soldier of the major armies. The peasant, factory worker, mostly peasant. Do you know that when the Tsar organizes, mobilizes his army in 1914, six million men, only four million have rifles? And some of these guys, only four, five, or six rounds of ammunition. The Germans in 1914, interesting. They start the war with 700,000 men in uniform, and because of that superior railroad system, which the Germans were renowned for, in three weeks, 3,700,000 men. No computers. <laughs> no computers. This is called German efficiency. Although the French were no slouch, they organized three million men in, th in three, four weeks with their, with their railroad system, too. But Stalin learns from this. Why? Because after he eases out Trotsky, Stalin in 1928 embarks on that, that well-renowned program of his forced industrialization. Because he knows another war is coming, he tr well, you know, Stalin, he doesn't trust anybody. Hated his mother for her, for her having put him in a seminary. Called her a bitch and doesn't see her for 40 years. But he starts that program of forced industrialization so that by 1940, the Soviet Union is the world's second leading industrial power behind the United States. Got to say one thing about Uncle Joe. He takes this country from a peasant economy to an atomic bomb in a generation, 20 years. But he understands Russia's weakness at the beginning of the First World War and with this incident in 1909 with the Austro-Hungarians absorbing Bosnia-Herzegovina. And what is Bismarck and Bismarck's prophecy comes true? Because where is Archduke Franz Ferdinand and Countess Sophie going to be assassinated? Sarajevo. And where is that? Bosnia. Bismarck was right. And then follows the guns of August, and the world plunges into war. Now keep in mind, what has this war been called? World War I? The Great War? The war to end all wars? Remember that term? Well, that's a misnomer if ever there was one, because as I'm going to talk about next week, Versailles is the biggest hoax ever perpetrated on modern man. I don't think this was fought for democracy. Why did the British and French keep their colonies after the war was over? It was also a European civil war. That's what this is. It is a European civil war. And that's going to be big when, I, when we come back next week. Why is it a European civil war? It fought for European issues, wasn't it? Colonialism, for one. Who were the major power, who were the major colonial powers in the world at the time? The Europeans? Yeah. The great navy race, I referenced it before. The great navy race. Who were most of the major naval powers? The Europeans, with the United States and Japanese coming on, but they're part of that imperialist group of powers too. 
And if you wanted to be in this Navy race and have an, have an empire overseas, you needed a large Navy, but you needed a battleship. You needed a whole bunch of battleships. The battleship, I referenced it before, is the world's first modern strategic arms race for the battleship was that epitome of weaponry at this stage of the Industrial Revolution. From the mid-1890s to the, time, the advent of the aircraft carrier in the first war, well, you're seeing the semblance of the aircraft carrier in the First World War. That's what this was. It's the world's first modern strategic arms race, and it's going to be a mirror image of what's going to come after the Second World War. And you know, because a lot of you people lived through it. That arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union with nuclear arms, same type of thing. Strategic advantage. Now the battleship at the time provided that, provided that aura of power with its big guns for a shooting, shooting power out and with its big guns as far as the eye could see. Of course, the aircraft carrier comes along, offering naval power to project, offering to project naval power beyond where the eye can see with aircraft. That's going to come later on. And also, monarchical or regal competition in Europe. As I mentioned, this was a mafia setup. I mean, they were, they, they, they were deciding the fates of millions of people, and a lot of them are related. It's interesting when, when you read some of the cables that were going between Tsar, Nic Tsar Nicholas II and Kaiser Wilhelm II after the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Because the Tsar was under intense pressure to mobilize. And he sent, on July 28th, I think it was, he sends Nicholas II and he says, I'm under tremendous pressure to mobilize. I'm under tremendous pressure. He doesn't say mobilize. I'm under tremendous pressure. Do what you can. Your loving cousin, Nicky. <laughs> he gets a reply. Understand fully. Will do my utmost. Will he? Yeah. Because of the fact the Russian system was slow, the Russians were actually discussing mobilization starting July 24, and the Germans don't know this. Rumors begin to float by the 29th. We understand that you've been talking about you know, mobilizing. This is what the Kaiser says to his cousin, the Tsar. And not thinking, the Tsar says, oh yeah, we've been discussing that since the 24th or the 25th. And the Tsar throws his hands up and says, my god, all my efforts are at an end. Germany begins to mobilize. Stalin remembered that one. Because when he was warned before June 22, 1941, that Hitler was coming, keep in mind, the Enigma codes had been broken. Remember that? The, German, the British were breaking the German code. They warned Stalin, Hitler's coming. Roosevelt, the magic code, breaking the Japanese diplomatic code. You know, diplomatic traffic, our, our, our code breakers are reading this stuff. Roosevelt warned St uh, Stalin, Hitler's coming. And what Stalin's reply he tells his generals, the capitalist countries would like nothing better than to see us and the Nazis go to war. So when they tell you something, believe the opposite. <laughs> he, understood he understood from history, though, that it was the Tsar's mobilization that caused the Germans to mobilize, and he was going to have no part of this in 1941. Although he did say no, that, no matter how inevitable a Nazi-Soviet conflict might be, Hitler will not attack us now. He was wrong. They're going to win in the end, but he was wrong. So you see these historical parallels going from 1914 to 1941. When we come back next week, I will talk about Versailles. And I'll leave you with this. I mentioned it earlier, and I'll leave, it, I'll leave you with this. What we call the Great War is not just 1914, 1918. It is 1914 and 1918, 21-year so hiatus, 1939 to 1945. That's your Great War. Yep. Interesting, isn't it? And one more thing. You know, as an offshoot of World War I, looking at that problem you have with Ukraine today, Putin understands one thing, if many Americans here do not. You know, the focal point of the Cold War 
after the Second World War, the focal point of the Cold War was where? Berlin, the collapse of the Nazis. The Russians now see the Cold War in Ukraine, and they don't like it. Putin understands one thing, like Stalin did. Germany invaded Russia, 1914. Poland invaded Bolshe young Bolshevik Russia in 1920. It was a young Poland, a, a newly minted Poland, as a result of Versailles, looking to carve out more territory than they were supposed to get. And then the big one, Operation Barbarossa, where Hitler invades the Soviet Union in 41. In less than 30 years, this country was invaded three times at the cost of upwards of 30 million people. So put yourself in the uh, seats of the Russians. When is enough enough? That's why Stalin wanted that border so far west. Putin understands this. So if we're going to solve this situation with Ukraine, you better understand that history. Or else you're, sh you're short selling yourself. And also throw in the Crimean War. The British and the French invaded the Crimea. That's another invasion. But the Russians understand this. The Russians understand this. And this is an offshoot of what? World War I. Anybody have any questions? Or any comments? <laughs> now my, my, wife, my, wife, my wife told me, she says, where are you going to the New Canaan Library? She says, why do those people want to sit and listen to Mr. Sunshine for? I just don't understand. <laughs> yes, sir? When you talk about Bismarck, Beg your pardon? Bismarck. Yes. Bismarck. Where does he get his idea, his grand old idea? His grand idea? From European history. He understood very well that if, you know, in this, in this new world, this modern world that's developing post-French, Great French War, that no longer are countries going to be able to project power militarily. It's going to come economically. And this is why he wanted a very, very strong Germany without going to war if that was possible. Superior politics, a superior economy will get you what you want in the new world. And that's how he was. Was he ahead of his time? Well, you could say so. But he understood the concept. He also understood that you better have some kind of social safety system for the people, if you want them on board, you got to give them a piece of the action. Or the whole thing's not going to work. And that's, now I mentioned earlier, he was, no, he was no great social emancipator. He was a pragmatic thinker, is what he was. And did he keep the peace in Europe? Well, I guess he better. He arranged the new balance of power. So who knew, who knew, who knew better than himself? He fashioned a new map of Europe. He knew how to wield it. Of course, once he's gone, now you're seeing a Europe run by, or trying to be run by a Kaiser who didn't fashion this balance of power. And is he going to mess it up? Yeah. You know what's interesting about the Kaiser? I, I'm asked, what about the Kaiser as opposed to Hitler? And I get, whenever I give my great white fleet talk, I'm asked about this. And I always say, you know, I say the best way to answer about the Kaiser is, do you have 200 military uniforms in your closet? You got 12 valets or valets home to dress you in the morning? When you sit down and eat plum pudding, do you wear a British Navy uniform? Of course, I guess the question is, how many people here eat plum pudding? You sit at your desk. What do you sit on? Anybody? Try a saddle for five hours. This is a man of strict military bearing. That's what he was. It's, it's now, I'm not going to tell you he was as dangerous a personage as Hitler. That's not the idea here. But you know, when the Great White Fleet returned home in 1909, George Washington's birthday, 1909, and after the Root Takahiro Agreement we signed with the Japanese to ameliorate a lot of the friction that had been building up between the two countries, Teddy Roosevelt kept most of the, Mer the Atlantic Fleet battleship force on the, on the Atlantic coast and not in the Pacific. What's Franklin D. Roosevelt, his cousin, going to, going to see as the greater threat in 1941? Germany again. Wow. Two presidents related see the same threat almost 30 years apart. Wow. 
History repeat itself? Yeah. Correct. The pressures are different, right? Obama said, I think, today or yesterday, it's going to be very expensive. Well, yeah, but I mean, we, we fail to, I think we fail to understand that they're still living in the old age. That's, that's a Russian sphere of influence. Whether it's Putin, whether it's Stalin, whether it's the Tsar. This is a Russian sphere of influence. Makes no difference who sits in Moscow, who sits in the Kremlin. This is a Russian sphere of influence. And there are old historical phobias as to why they're nervous. In fact, uh, Margie Thatcher, 1994, said, well, if we want to lessen these tensions, why don't we have Russia part of NATO? OK, Russia declined that because that would limit Russia's freedom of action politically. You know, the Russians weren't stupid. There's another, there's another aspect of this. Supposing Russia does become part of NATO. You know how many time zones Russia is? That's going to take NATO all the way out to that northern, northern border of China. Do you honestly think the Chinese are going to like a NATO on their northern border? Not on your life. That opens up another whole new historical phobia. The Chinese and colonialism. That's how they're going to see this. It, doesn't, it didn't happen. But that's how the Chinese would see this. So is it a good thing that Russia did not become part of Ukraine, uh, uh, NATO? Yeah. Could be. Well, we, we really won't know, but that's a projection. And I'll offer to you, that might be a pretty accurate projection. Yes? You know, it's like a superhero with your definition of fascism. Fascism? Fascism is virulent nationalism. It's also a corporate agenda, and it's also seized. It's almost like, it's almost like a polluted republic. Right. What is the true meaning of this corporate agenda? I mean, we're talking about Italy as compared to the nationalism of Russia or the virulent nationalism of Germany. So is understand, understand one thing about Nazi. National Socialist German Workers Party. The idea of workers means nothing. The I socialism, that doesn't mean a thing. There's two words that are, that are important here. National, German. That's fascism. Everything is geared to the race. Everything is geared to the corporations and the banks. The people have virtually no rights. So you have different corporations from different facets of your economy actually running those facets of the economy. The small businessman doesn't have a chance. Correct. That's fascism. During World War II, mm -hmm. I mean, how large was the corporate entity in Italy? Obviously not as large as it was, but Mussolini needed the help from the corporate bigwigs and the big time bankers to keep power. So that's where you see that mating of government and business. What do you think you're seeing here now? OK, you just answered that question. You tell some people that, and they'll be ready to throw you out, throw you out that door. I know. I mean, there's like a whole bunch of oligarchy with specific masters. OK, you are seeing that now. So what, what your father or your uncle or your grandfather fought against, fought against in World War II, we are now becoming. Interesting, isn't it? So what happened to the Constitution? Does the, the, does the president go before Congress and ask for a declaration of war anymore, like the founding fathers wanted? Okay. Okay. Correct. Well, that's 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 like our Declaration of Independence. Take, take one for your uh, that that document that document fascinates me. That was also a declaration of war. Because you have people, colonists, who are looking for a better deal telling the colo ranking colonial power in the world, hey, look, grab your colonial crap and get the hell out of here. That's a declaration of war. Well, they, you know, they didn't want to be basically under the thumb and the pain of the Right. But, 
that document, and we don't talk about it anymore, that document served as an inspiration to those uh, European revolutionaries in 1820, 1830, 1848. It's interesting. Right. The Declaration of the Rights of Man in the French Revolution was based off our Declaration of Independence. That's American exceptionalism. Not, not, what, not how American exceptionalism is described today. I think mentally in the past 50 years, if Russia, I mean, the US or Germany or NATO wanted to take Russia, they would have done it with the whole Berlin Wall and would have been over well, the, 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 the thing is, um, and they did not build up in Europe the Russians were under the impression, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, under the impression, Gorbachev knew there was nothing he could do to prevent a united Germany now. Have a good one. Take care. There was no way to prevent a united Germany. East and West Germany were going to be united. That's the hallmark of the beginnings of the Cold War, East and West Germany. There was nothing he could do to stop that, and there was nothing he can do with stopping Germany to become part of NATO. But they were under the impression that NATO was not going into Romania or Poland or, or, or Bulgaria or Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia. They were under that impression. What's happened now? Again, they see this as a threat. In reaction to Western policy, this is how the Russians. This doesn't make the Russians right. No, but it's just a recognition of history. But they had oil. They had until two months ago. They had oil that controlled most of Europe. They had them in the palm of their hands, and they blocked. Well, the, the Russians now. Because because he, because Putin has that navy base in Syria. That's what he wants. They want that. The problem here is, no, well, no, the problem here is the Russians want Assad to stay there. It's important for them because of the fact the majority of the population in Syria are Sunni Muslims. Assad's a Shia. Iraq is majority Shia Muslim, and now the leader is Shia when at first when Saddam was a Sunni. The fact of the matter is, they don't want Assad to go because of the fact the Russians have a large Muslim population. And their fear is if the Sunnis can win in Syria by throwing Assad out, then they'll get some guts in Russia and want to push the separatist agenda. And that's the last thing the Russians want. And China backs them up because why? China has Sunni Muslims in their country. So they want Assad to stay. Saudi Arabia wants Assad to go. Of course, it's a different reason. They're Sunni. The people are Sunni. Let's get rid of the Shia leader. You see what's happening here? But what happens in Syria is tied to what happens in Ukraine. Because why? Putin. And us. Well, how about Iran? How do they fit in with this Russian... Well, they're Shias too, but they're, they're God bless you, they're, but, but, they're, but they're not Arabs. They're Persians. Now you're not, now you're, now you're, now you're, now you're, <laughs> Now you're really broadening the scope here. Well, yeah, but then again, you know, there, there's you, you, pro you probably will see a deal here with, the, as you mentioned, the decline in oil prices. You are going to see a deal here with that nuclear program that the Iranians got going. Yeah, but what about oil? They have a lot of oil too. Well, yeah, they do. Which was why. Well, the, the the fact of the matter, yeah, but the fact of the matter is here. There, there's also that disagreement between Iran and Saudi Arabia for political control of the Middle East. So now you had a civil war in Syria, but now you have Iran and Saudi Arabia. The Saudis want to side out. The Iranians want him to stay because he's a Shia. And beyond going beyond Iran and Saudi Arabia, you have the Russians who want Assad to stay, the United States who wanted Assad to go. So now you have a local civil war, Iran and Saudi Arabia vying for regional control, and now you have the big powers coming in for global control. So what happened in Syria now has attracted these all these like iron filings to a magnet.
Oh, you haven't seen you haven't seen the end of this yet. Uh, see you next week. Have a good evening. Take yeah. care. Thanks Thank you. for coming. I need to interrupt. Can I have your check? I'm going to put everything away. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to do the right thing. So many nice comments. Oh, yeah. And a lot of people grabbing books before they left. So, you know, you're sparking some stuff. It's great. I'm so glad that you're here. Good. Who did he say won from Asada? Russia won? No, Russia won from him. Yeah. Yeah. We won. We won from Saudi Arabia. Yeah. 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 won from Yeah, I think a lot of people have done that. Saudi Arabia won. Saudi Arabia won. Yeah. 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 But this was really extraordinary. Thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. Of course, the, the real interesting one will be in two weeks. Yes, yeah. I'm curious to hear what you'll have to say for that. You know, when we did the, the whole lineup, I was like, that's the one I think I really want to check out. There's still World War One, but there's still no reason to bypass that aspect of it. Hmm. And uh, this is why I always keep that separate, because you can't include that, because it, 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 it's yeah. there's too much going on. Handouts left over, and we got our display, and we should be good to go. Oh, and a random pen. Somebody take your hand. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Yeah, I won't take the order. Pack up here. Thank you. Sure.